Hello and welcome to my next video on the liver. Firstly, excretion. Excretion is the removal of metabolic waste from the body. There are two main products you need to know about which are excreted. at CO2, carbon dioxide, and nitrogenous compounds. Carbon dioxide is produced by every living cell in the body as a result of respiration. And you also have urea is produced in the liver from excess amino acids. So why are these substances excreted? Well, because they are harmful to the body. You have CO2. Now, CO2 will be transported into bloods and be exhaled in the lungs. But when it goes into red blood cells, there is an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Now, this will... Um, convert the, well, the the carbon dioxide is converted into hydrogen hydrogen carbonate ions that's HCO3 minus ions so once it is in a red blood cell the enzyme carbonic anhydrase will cause the hydrogen ions to combine with hemoglobin they compete with oxygen for space on the hemoglobin and if there is too much carbon dioxide in blood this can reduce transport because the H plus ions prevent as much oxygen being transported so you don't get as much oxygen around the body also you can get the formation of carbamina haemoglobin which again lowers the affinity for oxygen so this is all bad also it makes carbon dioxide makes things more acidic more H plus ions make acidic now the proteins in the blood act as buffers so they res resist the change pH, pH if there is a small change but if there is a big change the proteins become, become denatured particularly if the pH drops below 7.35 and it results in slow to difficult breathing, headaches, drowsiness, restlessness, tremors, and confusion. And you might have changes in heart rate and blood pressure. Now this is called respiratory acidosis, and it can, well, be very bad for you. Nitrogenous compounds. Now, you break down proteins and amino acids, because amino acids contain a lot of energy, almost as much as, carb um, as carbohydrates, so you don't want to waste that get rid of them so we deaminate them this breaks them down but releases a toxic NH2 that's the amine section of the amino acid so we want to get rid of this firstly it will combine with another H plus to form NH3 that's ammonia which is even more toxic but it is then converted into urea and then excreted so the liver what does the liver do it controls levels of glucose, amino acids, and lipids, synthesizes red blood cells, bile, plasma proteins, and cholesterol, storage of vitamins A, D, and B12, iron, and glycogen. It undergoes, uh, um, helps in detoxification, breaking down of hormones, and destruction of red blood cells. Here is a cross section of a bit of liver. So you have lots of liver cells, and you have a main hepatic vein. The hepatic vein takes deoxygenated blood away from the liver. Because at any one time you can have up to 30% of the blood of the body in the liver. Now, in the hepatic vein you have different branches of um, vessels flowing into it. So, the hepatic artery, which supplies the liver with oxygenated blood from the heart, so that's need for respiration. The hepatic portal vein brings blood from the duodenum and ileum, that's in the small intestines. So it is rich in products from digestion, so harmful substances can be broken down. So you have the amino acids, the fat, everything coming in through the hepatic portal vein. And then you also have a bile duct. Now the bile duct will take bl takes bile to the gallbladder to be stored. Now, this, what bile does is it emulsifies fats, but bile is produced by the liver cells, so you have a separate canal. So you can see branch of the bile duct is not connected to the hepatic vein. But the hepatic artery and hepatic portal vein will flow in to the hepatic vein, and they'll mix up. Now, this, when, all these, when the hepatic artery and hepatic portal vein join together, you get a sinusoid. Now, this whole part is called a lobe, and then you get cylindrical lobules. Now, each lobule has a central vein in the middle, as we said, that's the hepatic vein, and then the hepatic artery and hepatic portal vein and bile duct are all surrounding it. 
the hepatic artery and portal vein will flow into it. And you then get them all flowing into the hepatic vein. There'll be many of these. The hepatic artery and hepatic portal vein are connected to the central vein by capillaries called sinusoids. As you can see, that's what connects them all together. The sinusoid is surrounded by liver cells. These enter into the intralobule vessel as a branch of the hepatic vein. Now, liver cells are quite unspecialized. They are, well, they're very simple, but take part in lots of metabolic processes. Now, since they take in lots of reactions, they have lots of mitochondria, very dense cytoplasm, lots of different organelles, so Golgi apparatus, reticulum, all that. Now, there's another type of cell, the Kupfer cell. What this will do, this will break down pathogens and destroy any old damaged red blood cells. These are like, these are a type of macrophage. That's what you need to know about the structure of the liver. So urea, how is urea formed? You have amino acid will become ammonia plus a keto acid, which we'll show later. In between these processes, amino acids are broken down by deamination. And ammonia is converted into urea through the ornithine cycle. As you can see here, we've got, this is how um, ammonia is formed. You have an amino acid plus oxygen becomes a keto acid. The keto, for any budding chemists out there, is the double O, C double O bond, as you can see, and then H3, which is ammonia. Deamination, this is how deamination occurs. First, nitrogen-containing amino acid groups are removed from any excess amino acid, forming ammonia and organic acids. The organic acids can be respired to give ATP, or converted to carbohydrate and stored as glycogen. And then ammonia, which is a byproduct, is too toxic for mammals to excrete directly, so it's combined with CO2 in the ornithine cycle, as we will go on to next. Here it is. Don't worry, it is a lot less confusing than it looks. Hopefully. So, you have a molecule of ammonia plus CO2 will release H2O and then go to citrulline. Another NH3 will join in, release another water molecule, and this will form agronine. Then that water molecule is reused with agronine and becomes urea, and then ornithine is, occurs. Now if you look at these three equations I've got... <laughs> Sorry, that was Stephen sneezing in my video, if you heard that. As I was saying, the reactions, three reactions you can see here for anyone who does chemistry, these are not exact reactions. I'm using these to show the overall equation. So, yes, I know NH3 plus CO2 does not form water, but it shows two molecules of NH3 on the left-hand side, one molecule of CO2. Now you have two molecules on the right hand side of water and one molecule on the left. Now two of those waters cancel out because they're just reused. So you only have one H2O left and one molecule of urea. So overall it is 2NH3 plus CO2 becomes H2O plus CO brackets NH2 close brackets 2. And that's the formula for urea. Detoxification. Now when you drink alcohol in particular, the ethanol, that is toxic so we need to detoxify it. So ethanol, for anyone who does chemistry, becomes is oxidized, become ethanol, and then ethanoic acid. The ethanoic acid will then recombine with ethanol to form will form the uh, ester. But the ethanoate is the bit that is important. The ethanoate will then combine with coenzyme A to form acetyl coenzyme A, which is formed in respiration and used. Every time when he's oxidized, two H is left. Now what this does is a molecule called NAD, NAD, which you'll learn about in respiration, and we do that later. Well, this 2H will reduce it, so it becomes from NAD to reduced NAD, or NAD if you want to actually use it properly. Now, NAD, what it does, it is used to oxidize and break down so it breaks down and oxidizes fatty acids which are used in respiration, so it's important. Now, if it becomes reduced NAD, it can't do that. So what happens is, as we'll explain a little bit later, is that fatty acids build up in the liver. Now, this happens twice. Each time ethanol and ethanol are, are, are 
turned into their later co counterpart. Now, each time ethanol and ethanol are broken down, you have ethanol dehydrogenase and ethanol dehydrogenase. And then that's how they are detoxified. Now, fatty liver. That's when you have too much ethanol. Not enough NAD is left. Fatty acids are converted to lipids and stored in the hepatocytes. Leads to hepatitis or chorosis. Now, this means that you get swelling, the liver, scar tissue can form, and it's very bad. So, in conclusion, you need to excrete in particular CO2 and nitrogenous compounds such as urea. You deaminate amino acids, and then they will be turned into urea. You detoxify alcohol. Now, to get rid of urea, there's the ornithine cycle. And if you have too much alcohol, you can cause damage to the liver. Very quickly, other things that can also damage the liver. Paracetamol, common painkiller that's broken down by the liver. Excess paracetamol in the blood can lead to liver and kidney failure. Insulin is a hormone that controls blood glucose concentration, as you know. Insulin is also broken down by the liver, as excess insulin can cause problems with blood sugar levels. So that's something else it removes. Anyway, thank you for watching. As usual, any comments, likes, anything, just please feel free or email me. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.